so I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't begun. We haven't begun. This isn't the beginning. There is, I'm just warning you, there's going to be a five, and there's going to be a tap. So... <laughs> Face as she revels in the joyous moment, uh, forgetting any minor of niggling pain. <laughs> now, of course, once you've had your baby, you have to look after it. Now, uh, my own mother, she uh, she had nine children, and as such, our caravan was constantly a rocking, so no one came a knocking. <laughs> in fact, the space was so tight at one point that uh, we were all kept in fish tanks. Uh, after mother had seen something on the news about the Japanese growing square melons in glass boxes to reduce on space. Now, uh, I thought it was rather fun, actually. I, uh, I didn't mind it. <laughs> Thankfully, mother drew the line at feeding us fish food. <laughs> Although, uh, I don't know when my brother suffocated in his tank, we did have to endure the sight of her trying to flush him down the toilet. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but the point was, she was a busy working woman and didn't always have time to care for her children. In fact, many of the time I'd go up to her and she'd say, I don't care. So I <laughs> I know what it's like for a busy working mum trying to find time to spend with her child. So I invented this. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, it's joyously shambolic, isn't it? Joyously shambolic. I invented this. The crumpet patented laptop nappy. Each diaper comes with a detachable strap and a on plier so that uh, you can be with baby as you work. <laughs> and as an added bonus, uh, if baby has a brother or sister, you could hook them up to a printer, but uh, <laughs> not a scanner. <laughs> you have to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> so once you've had your baby and you've looked after it, you probably should feed it. <laughs> uh, now apparently, uh, uh, as a child, I was reluctant to go tete-a-tete with mother, <laughs> uh, preferring instead to consume semi-skin. <laughs> In fact, the only way she could get me to lock on was to, uh, to draw a cow on her breast uh, so it looked more like a calf. Now, this, this got me thinking about other fussy babies in my situation. So, I ran straight to the drawing board and I came up with this. The milk carton bra. <laughs> actually, actually well, whilst we're on the subject of milk, I have calcium-packed bone to pick with those winged thieves of the dawn chorus, sparrows. Years ago, I get so excited for my breakfast in the morning, I would rush downstairs, fling open the door, and there would be carnage. Carnage! With this feathered dictator who had pecked away at my milk bottle tops. Yes, I hadn't seen so much thrashed metal since I accidentally turned up to a Slipknot concert. <laughs> you see, I mistakenly assumed from their nautical name I'd be treated to an evening of sea shanties. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I was pissed off with the birds. So I decided to come up with an invention that would hopefully act as a deterrent to other birds thinking of turning to a life of crime. It's made of 70% reinforced steel and 30% malice. It's, 
<laughs> oh, it's deliciously shambolic now. We've gone from glorious to delicious, haven't we? It's, uh, well, it's not, I'm not busy. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, you pay this amount of money for a projector and then you expect, oh, well, that's ruined the engine, isn't it? That's ruined. <laughs> now, there we go. The, the, there. <coughs> We've reinforced it. And malice. There, figure one. Pegs the top. Figure two. Bigs come off. Blood everywhere. And don't, don't give me that RSPCA crap. No. Royal Society for the Protection of Criminal Animals is what that stands for. If, if I was kidnapped and tortured by a gang of unruly toucans, they would probably pay for their defence and bring in expert witnesses from animals with the funniest things. <laughs> My point was, they suffer and I get whooped. <laughs> so, uh, moving on. Let's, so let's do the history section. Do the lights and the music for the history section. delve into my family history and introduce to you uh, one of my ancestors who was also uh, a famous inventor. Now the reason I'm doing this section is because I think it's important to know where we come from. Uh, I, for example, live in a cul-de-sac. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Alfred Crumpet. Born in uh, 1413, uh, died in Seine. <laughs> he became rather famous in his day for inventing the world's first fully reloading automatic bow and arrow. It was, uh, well, it's basically an arrow on a piece of elastic. Uh, you see, the archer would fire at the enemy and it would spring back, ready to be reloaded and used again. Now, I thought this was a genius idea. So I approached the Ministry of Defence, who then commissioned me to come up with something similar for the modern British army, uh, using a hand grenade. But, uh, <laughs> the results were... Uh, mixed. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I am as fed up as a cat by the damage caused to my roof by superheroes landing on it in the night. <laughs> now, I don't mind when a superhero sits on the chimney staring at the moon looking moody. That's a superhero's prerogative. In fact, in fact I do it myself sometimes. Now, whenever I'm feeling little as the French would say, uh, blah, I'll squelch into a lycra body stocking and sit atop the roof of the Batman theme tune blasting out of a boombox. That's my prerogative. But what really robs my rhubarb <laughs> is when bat and cat, man and woman respectively, are belting seven shades of shit out of each other, which quite frankly plays merry hell with my thatch. <laughs> so, I've come up with an invention that should hopefully put an end to this. I call it the superhero proof roof. <laughs> a highly polished glass surface is placed atop the roof, so that any superheroes landing on top of it won't be able to get a grip, and they'll fall off and break their neck, resulting in minor embarrassment or, uh, or death. <laughs> so, moving away from my problems in suburbia, and into the city. Prior to 9-11, the greatest threat to our skyscrapers was King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Consider this just of statistics. In 1933, the Empire State Building was attacked by a lovelorn ape. As you can see from this graph, that's over one attacks per century. <laughs> I think you'll agree the numbers are shocking. <laughs> so with this in mind, I plan on approaching all city officials and telling them to build this in every city. <laughs> a giant banana-shaped skyscraper with a jumbo mousetrap at the bottom of it. You see the marauding gorilla will spy the skyscraper and uh, not know whether to eat it or to climb it. And then as soon as that dumb, dirty ape lays his hands on it, the trap will snap and in moves the city official of the Kong-sized coffin. Uh, a newly created funeral industry. So from one king of the swingers to another. Heavily busted women caught in earthquakes. <laughs> there is nothing more embarrassing than for a uh, heavy of chest woman to uh, get caught in an earthquake and have her lovely wobble to and fro. <laughs> So, in order to hide her red face, I think she should wear this 
clock face mask, <laughs> so that any passers by will simply think she's a pendulous timepiece. <laughs> and died a year later in the Great Fire of London. <laughs> there came the day where he had to bury one of his own friends. Of course, the next day he returned to pay his respects, uh, but alas, there were so many bodies in the hole, he didn't know where to put the flowers. Uh, I should point out, it was a very big hole. I mean, uh, if I were to, uh, to put it on this uh, graph of big holes, I would say it falls at somewhere between the, um, the rabbit hole that Winnie the Pooh fell into and an apocalyptic asteroid crater. So you get some idea of scale. He vowed that day to come up with an invention that would allow loved ones to find the location of the deceased. So he invented this. It's called the, uh, the Gravestone Codpiece. <laughs> you see, the wearer was buried in this up and the, uh, the copies were protruding off the soil, alerting them to the location of their loved ones. Uh, however, uh, problems did arise uh, once the, uh, the user was buried face down. <laughs> society. I think you'll agree with me when I say our society is rife with problems many of which have been documented by, or indeed caused by, Daddy Dyer. <laughs> so I set out on my biggest quest yet, to perfect society. And I thought, how can I do this? How can I do this? So to do this, I thought I'd turn my eyes to the animal kingdom to see which of their society functioned the best. And then I thought, well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's obvious. The bees. The bees work. Everybody has their role. It all runs efficiently. So then I thought, how can we translate their society into our society? But essentially, it would have meant everybody living in blocks of flats sniffing nectar and taking in turns to fuck the queen. So, rather than change society as a whole, I thought, why not build up to Brick by social brick. Uh, sort of a goodwill pyramid, if you will, except, except without a dead Egyptian inside it. <laughs> because that's a political potato and I'm not touching out with a spork. <laughs> so, uh, then I thought, well, let's deal with first homelessness. I think you'll agree with me, there is nothing worse than, uh, than taking a stroll down the pavement. And uh, woe is me, there is a bearded man or woman cluttering up the pavement, taking up valuable space that could be used for something more useful to society, like, uh, like a bin. Or a, or a hookup. Well, the same, same difference, really. <laughs> so, uh, I decided to come up with something that would put an end to homelessness in our lifetime. It's, uh, well, it's essentially a hat. Um, now, you will notice that the retailer's recommended price on this is £75. Now, uh, that might seem a little steep, <laughs> but uh, I do think you lose something if you uh, remove the fully working chimney stack. Uh, of course, the main problem with the product is that it's very easily, uh, easily damaged by uh, superheroes landing on it in the night. <laughs> now, it's simply not enough to disguise the homeless as houses, is it? <laughs> right, no, we have to get to the root of the problem. Beards. <laughs> I'm, I'm often asked, uh, Stan, where do you come up with your ideas? Or, uh, or what the hell were you thinking when you made that? <laughs> so, I'll turn to the judge, and I'll say, uh, it was given to me by God. Or sometimes by lesser known inventors who die in mysterious circumstances shortly after sharing their ideas with me. <laughs> but the other day, I had an idea all by myself. I was, I was driving home uh, in the rain, watching the windscreen wipers go about their business. And then I thought, what if I attach razor blades to those wipers? 
And what if I could attach those wipers to the face in such a way as to reduce the fuss of shaving? <laughs> and thus was born the bi-nasal, aural-inserted, windscreen wiper-inspired razor blade shaver wiper. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> Yeah, now, now, of course, we, we've dealt with the homeless uh, through my hatting and shaving program. It's time to set our sights on the seedy underbelly of the society and uh, give it a tickle. Set our sights on the wagging tail of criminality. Or more specifically, prison overcrowding. It's a well known fact that due to deforestation, there are now more criminals than there are rainforests in Great Britain. <laughs> <laughs> so with this shocking statistic in mind, I decided to come up with something that could reduce on prison overcrowding. So I came up with the criminal punishment body cage. Uh, however, uh, someone, well actually my own mother uh, pointed out to me that uh, uh, electronic bracelets perform a similar function. And uh, that my design infringes on several copyrights filed by her fetish dungeon. And, uh, that you see that idea. So, now that's uh, actually talking about that, talking about that. Uh, I remember as a child, uh, she gathered all the, all the family around, all the nine, nine children in the caravan, and we sat down and we watched Live Aid. And I think you agree with me when I say there is nothing sadder, nothing sadder, and then turning on the TV and seeing starving people covered in flies. And then I thought, well, so Bob, it's obvious. It's obvious what you do. You send spiders to Africa. Crates full of spiders, they'll weave their webs and eat up all the flies, everybody wins. Uh, now, I thought it might be nice in this section. To, uh, to read out some of the letters I've received uh, from my fan club. <laughs> uh, it won't go, really, it won't go. Really received some of the letters from my fan club. So I, I thought I'd start with this one, which I uh, received uh, from a child star. Dear Stanley Crockett, I used to be a big child star in Hollywood, but puberty has riddled my face with spots. In fact, so scarred am I by acne craters, when I look in the mirror, I often think, who painted a face on the moon? <laughs> and then, then applied some stubble to it using PVA glue and, and bits of old hair. Also, there are ears on the moon. It sounds like zippy. Not cartoony ears that stick out. I've done the voice too far now. I'm too, too far. Just average ears with mild amounts of downy hair. Not so much to it, but this goes on for some time in my eye shorts. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Can you cure my spots? Yours sincerely, M. Culkin. <laughs> well, Mr. Culkin, you're in love. With my acne oil well, you can say goodbye to spots forever. <laughs> By harnessing the power of puberty, I believe I've discovered a new kind of biofuel. So in the future, when you pop your car bonnet, instead of seeing an engine in there, you may very well see a teenager greasing his chops with the day old dog about. Uh, that's also solving the problem of how to keep kids off our streets. So, uh, every other They protect 12 inches of trouser and leave the rest of you exposed to muck. And, and farmers have it worse, let me tell you. Farmers have it much worse. Every day for them is like Glastonbury. Except, uh, <laughs> except instead of watching bands, they, they watch their flock. And, uh, instead of drunkenly tent hopping and uh, sowing their wild oats, they, uh, they sow actual oats. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, if I were to class a farmer as a dog, I would say he was a mucky pup. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they needn't be. Because, <laughs> by extending the welly concept from its original 12 inches, I have created the Wellington suit. You see, uh, the Wellington suit protects the whole body. <laughs> and you'll notice there, there is a gas mask styled front. Uh, now, this was a late addition to the design, after some farmers initially uh, reported uh, some uh, mild breathing problems. <laughs> the, uh, the problem being that... Uh, well, they couldn't. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so, I'd rather not talk about that. <laughs> now, as a keen gardener, uh, living in suburbia, uh, as many of you may well be, in fact, you may agree with me on this, uh, there's nothing worse than uh, finding a fox rummaging through your bins. No, nothing worse. Going gar-gar for your garbage. Maybe gar-gar for my garbage. But in order to stop that from happening, 
I have started hiding a bin bag, uh, sorry, a bear inside every bin bag. So, uh, so I've, uh, I've not had any foxes or, uh, or bin men. <laughs> <laughs> now, finally, on a gardening theme, um, uh, another thing which also kind of gets my goat is when you find a lamp farm. And I have tried everything to get rid of them. I have tried a hot water, uh, ant powder, uh, eviction notices, <laughs> uh, sending one ant to a terrorist training camp in Afghanistan in the hope that you'd return one day and suicide bomb the nest. Uh, actually, on that point, I bought that ant and returned to get first class, never used it. Rude, if anything else. <laughs> so, uh, so I came up with an invention to end my ant nest problem. The answer? Genetic engineering. Through genetic engineering, I have created a hybrid of ant and serial killer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Harold Shipmant. <laughs> now, shortly after introducing Dr. Harold to the nest, I received a letter uh, from one of the ants inside. <laughs> so, uh, the letter A, free small. <laughs> functioning army tank. Uh, however, uh, some people, uh, let's call them experts, are saying that uh, well, it wasn't really a tank because it didn't have any armour. Um, they're also taking on with, with the term uh, fully functioning uh, because the recoil on the cannon was so strong that it actually snapped the horse's legs clean off. Uh, so it really only functioned once. Uh, of course, the other problem was that uh, at the moment the cannon went off, the bang was so loud that the horse would rear up in terror, causing a downward trajectory, which would actually launch the horse into space like some kind of equine rocket, uh, actually putting my ancestors several generations ahead of NASA. Um, of course, uh, the horse wouldn't reach space now, it's silly. No, it, uh, it would simply fall onto the enemy, uh, earning it the nickname Horse Bomb, uh, which was later shortened to the more common moniker, H-Bomb. So um, that's the origin of that. Now, since fitting a cat flap into my house, I have been subject to uh, an array of strange cats entering the house. And, and some strange men as well. <laughs> in fact, the whole episode left me wondering if I want to buy a cat. But uh, <laughs> then I thought, what if there was some kind of helmet a cat could wear with a shape on top of it that corresponds to the shape of the cat flap, thus allowing entry only to those cats with the corresponding shape? And thus was born the cat flap key hat. <laughs> uh, now moving away from cats uh, onto their natural enemy and mine. Um, the birds. Who here has been attacked by a bird? <laughs> just me, just me. But I assure you it is a more common problem than you may think. Uh, for example, off the top of my head, um, Tippy Hedron uh, was attacked by actual birds during the making of Hitchcock's The Birds. Um, <laughs> Michael Parkinson suffered a sustained attack by the Rothhard's emu. And uh, Big Bird used to kill for crack. So, uh, so with this in mind, I came up with a bird deterring hat. It's made of 50% crushed velvet and 50% a man with a gun and a blast. And of course, it is not simply uh, only birds, though, that are attacking you. No. Anyone who has ridden a bicycle in the countryside will understand the pain of having insects flying into your face and your teeth. But this may be a problem either. If you wear my helmet, which is topped with a chameleon, who is particularly well <laughs> see any insect flying towards it will be uh, licked into oblivion by one flick of that tongue. Uh, actually, actually thinking about it, that might come in useful for those, uh, those uh, spiders and uh, flies with the uh, starving Africans I was on about earlier. They, uh, Although, to be fair, they, uh, they don't actually have bikes over there, do they? So you'll probably have to start some kind of blue peter pill first to get them the bikes and then send them the hell on it. So, sort, of a, sort of a chicken and egg question. Like, which came first, the, uh, the chicken or the, uh, the, the starving African with the bicycle? <laughs> but then you may say, uh, well, if you've got a chicken, why not give the African the bird? 
Or to that I say, you uh, can't pass your cycling proficiency test on a chicken. <laughs> this. Uh, it's a, a handwritten letter uh, from a surfer who had both his arms bitten off by a shark. Dear <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I'm a surfer who's had both his arms bitten off by a shark. <laughs> Yours sincerely, a surfer who's had both his arms bitten off by a shark. <laughs> that letter moved. <laughs> so then I thought, how can we prevent further shark attacks on surfers? And then I thought, what's the one thing a shark fears the most? So, I came up with my greatest invention now. A surfboard in the shape of Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> the attacking shark will recognise Spielberg. Da -da -da -da. See him holding, holding the vodka for Schindler's List. Da -da -da -da. You'll then recognise him, remember what hard taskmaster he is whilst directing. Da -da 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 -da. And then run away in the opposite direction for fear of being cast in Jaws Live, Life's a Beach. Da -da -da. <laughs> I recently went on a five-star cruise. The, uh, the five stars on it were uh, Sue Pollard, Jane McDonald, <laughs> Little and Large, and a renegade member of the Blue Man Group who gone solo. <laughs> Unfortunately, that cruise lost a star when that poor blue man fell overboard and drowned. You see, uh, see nobody to see where to throw the lifesavers. Um, <laughs> first. At first, all the passengers, we grouped together and we decided on a carpet bombing strategy, throwing out all the lifesavers in the hope that he'd be close enough to grab one. And of course, once that didn't work, I cracked open a packet of polos and chucked those in. I mean, you clutch at anything. <laughs> at the time, passengers laughed at me. But uh, a few days later, uh, that poor blue man washed up on a nearby shore, uh, heavily decomposed, but minty fresh. So, uh, <laughs> so who's laughing now? Eh? <laughs> Unfortunately, more retrospectively, rather, I came up with an invention uh, that would hopefully stop this uh, from ever happening again. It was, uh, it was essentially a uh, headband uh, with a blind in it that the drowning man can pull down to reveal a pinky face so that he stands out against the blue of the Caribbean Sea. Uh, unfortunately, it's unlikely that this product will ever see the light of day uh, because, uh, well, I've had it confiscated. Uh, apparently, an open casket at the funeral isn't the best place for a product demonstration. So, uh, who knew? <laughs> uh, on our water thing still, from a one ill-fated cruise to another, uh, Titanic. A friend of mine, he is, uh, well he's writing a book about the Titanic, and he has been kind enough to ask me to write the foreword. So, before I unveil my next invention, I, I thought it might be quite, uh, quite, quite nice to set the context and read that, uh, read that foreword for you. This is, um, <coughs> this is from uh, Titanic, why I claimed a refund. Died in 1890, doing what he loved best, self-harming. <laughs> 
<laughs> but although his lifespan matched that of the average cockatiel, he achieved much more in his lifespan than every uh, than any decorative bird. In fact, uh, well, actually, it's for a bit of fun. I uh, I created a graph uh, showing this. Uh, um, as you can uh, see from this chart here, uh, Alfred Crumpet was the inventor of the world's first portable music player, uh, whilst the cockatiel has achieved uh, well nothing. <laughs> well, not much. I mean, uh, in terms of evolution, it's done pretty well for itself. Although, uh, although not as well as a shark. Pretty sure a shark could win a fight with a cockatiel. Or, or Alfred, for that matter. Pretty sure a shark could eat Alfred. <laughs> or a cockatiel. Although, well, they're, they're quite small. I mean, it would be the, uh, the equivalent of a king eating a seed. So, uh, probably more, more than one. A packet of cockatiels, if you will. Is that, yeah, they are quite Moorish. <laughs> but uh, anyway, back to Alfred. Back to Alfred. He was the inventor and became rather famous in his day for predating the Apple Nano by inventing the top hat gramophone. You see, uh, uh, shortly after uh, inventing this, uh, he distanced himself from the product. The problem being that uh, several users reported uh, neck problems. The problem being that it broke them. <laughs> so. Uh, we don't really talk about him in our family anymore. He's uh, very much the the, uh, the the black cockatiel. No, it's not really well. Black sheep, black sheep. That's fine. Just do the lights. We'll, we'll get this bit over. This is done. This is done. Move on. Lights, lights, music, music. <laughs> So uh, before I unveil uh, my contribution to aviation history, I thought it might be nice to set the context uh, around this, so I'll give you a few facts about aviation. Uh, fact one, uh, air passenger travel was invented by entrepreneurial pterodactyls who would fly smaller dinosaurs to safety after charging them a small fee. <laughs> fact two, the Wright brothers were the first people to join the Mile High Club. <laughs> fact three, orangutans are heavily endangered because pilots mistake their long outstretched arms for runways and crush them up on land. <laughs> so uh, now you've got an idea of the history of aviation. And I've come up with an invention that will hopefully put an end to air crash fatalities in our lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, the black box suit. <laughs> now, two things inspired the design. Uh, first of all, it seemed obvious, I'm sure we've all thought it. The only thing to survive a crash in the black box, why not make a suit out of it? Uh, but the second thing, the, uh, the second thing that inspired me was the fact that not one single medieval knight wearing a suit of armour has ever died in a plane crash. <laughs> so, uh, food for thought. Airline food for thought. <laughs> now, since watching Psycho, I have had a morbid fear of taking showers in foreign hotels. In fact, the, uh, the problem's gotten so bad that uh, oftentimes when I go on holiday, the moment I step off the plane, I'll uh, break my own legs uh, just so I can spend two weeks in hospital enjoying the sponge baths. <laughs> so uh, and let me tell you, that's no mean feat when you're wearing a black box suit. <laughs> but my days of fearing being zipped up in a body bag with only partially conditioned hair may be over. You see, I have created a shower curtain imprinted with the outline of a serial killer on it. You see, anyone creeping into the bathroom will cast a shadow onto the curtain. If that shadow matches that of the serial killer, then, then you should grab another one of my inventions, the loofah-shaped machete, and defend yourself. <laughs> if, however, uh, the shadow does not match that uh, of the, uh, the serial killer, then that raises some fairly serious questions about who has access to your bathroom and for what reason. So, uh, we, won't, we won't talk about that. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll be, uh, you'll be in the middle of an autopsy, and, uh, <laughs> and you'll be thinking this would be so much easier if, uh, if there was some kind of zip on the torso that would allow easier access. <laughs> well, with one whip of this zip, you'll be up to your elbow and organs faster than you can say Ron Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I don't want to bring the tone down. Uh, I was recently a pallbearer for an elderly relative. Uh, oh, he wasn't quite dead, uh, but uh, it was the only time of the year we get all the family together. So. Unfortunately, there's a history of brittle bones in my family. 
So the moment that the, uh, the coffin was hoisted up, it uh, probably collapsed into a big pile like some macabre game of Jenga. Uh, there were no winners. No winners. <laughs> so, of course, there were Lifter Muggins here to come up with an invention to get that coffin moving down the aisle again. So, I came up with this. I call it the clockwork coffin. Uh, the good news is that the clockwork mechanism worked, and the coffin started moving down the aisle again, uh, causing the, you know, the service to have to go on the move. Uh, the bad news is that uh, well, it, it didn't stop working, um, so uh, on the negative side, I uh, managed to cause a motorway pile-up. <laughs> so, on the plus side, though, I managed to prove that my invention could survive a motorway pile-up, <laughs> but, uh, but on the negative side again, I managed to prove that most of the, uh, the people at the funeral couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but even that has a silver lining because I've suddenly had an impact on all this. So, uh, <laughs> History. I'd like to introduce now to Charlie Crumpet. Uh, born in 1876, died in Compton. <laughs> he became rather infamous in his day, uh, famous, fame. He became rather famous in his day <laughs> for inventing the steam powered roller skate. You see, the user would place their foot into the water filled shoe, a fire would then lit underneath, causing an eruption of steam which would propel the user forward. Now, I thought, what japes? What a good idea. Why not make this for a modern audience? However, I, uh, I'm not really allowed to talk about it because uh, I'm being sued. <laughs> so, <laughs> move on, move on. <laughs> now let's move beyond death and into the supernatural. Farming. <laughs> there are many modern issues uh, facing the modern farmer in the modern world. Uh, for example, uh, rising food prices, uh, foot and mouth disease, uh, the uh, troubles and antics of fantastic Mr. Fox. <laughs> it's from aliens abducting the cows. Now you may be thinking to yourselves, this sounds like a case for Mulder and Scully, not, uh, not Crumpet and... Well, I don't actually have anyone. <laughs> I, uh, I work alone. Like uh, a Columbo. <laughs> or, uh, Take one. <laughs> but in order to hide our bovine friends from overhead viewers, I came up with something. I call it camouflage. It's a it's basically a hat and coat combo made of grass, uh, so that when viewed from above, the cow will uh, blend into the surrounding fields like a virgin at the Star Trek. Convention. <laughs> but then I thought, no, no, because once another cow sees the cow wearing a coat of grass, it's highly probable that that cow will climb on top of the cow and start grazing on the cow coat grass. And then, of course, once another cow sees the cow grazing on the cow coat grass, that's highly probable that that cow will climb on top of the cow, who's on top of the cow, start grazing on the cow coat grass, grazing on the cow, grazing on the cow coat grass, and I'm a string. So, you end up with the, uh, the even worse problem of cow stacking, uh, where they actually stack so far that they go into space where it's easier for aliens to abduct them. So, uh, we didn't pursue that idea. Werewolves. <laughs> it has come to my attention, viral documentary, that there is on the loose an American werewolf in London, not the North <laughs> Now, we have to protect ourselves. I said, lock the doors, please! And how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, first, we must identify a werewolf and come up with a foolproof way. So, I've taken a scientific brain scan of a werewolf. As you can see from this scientific brain scan, their brain is divided into three sections. One for howling at the moon, one to identify, uh, to, for tormenting villagers, and one for pursuing a movie career. <laughs> if we compare this to this scientific brain scan of an actual human being, we can see that their brain is primarily concerned with not being a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> However, it's, uh, well, it's simply not enough to, uh, to only identify uh, the, uh, the, the, the werewolf. You know. We have to come up with a foolproof way of stopping them from transforming under the full moon in the first place. So I thought, how can we do this? How can we do this? 
We paint the moon black. Who's going to take on such a thankless task? A mammoth task, I hear you ask. Criminals. We give criminals buckets of paint and send them to the moon, thus reducing on prison overcrowding and solving my earlier problem. Now, uh, finally, it's been pointed out to me that I've been looking a little skinny recently. Or, uh, or to quote my dear mother, I've been looking like a gangly streak of good like this. <laughs> and I shall tell you for why. I haven't been able to get into my, uh, into my kitchen because my oven has become haunted by the ghosts of chickens I've cooked in it. <laughs> now, thankfully, I've come up with an invention that will hopefully put an end to my hen haunting. You see, uh, by inserting an oven into the torso of spiritualist medium Derek Akora, <laughs> he is in a prime position to tell the ghosts to go into the light. Uh, not the oven light, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, swings and roundabouts. Because whilst I'm now free of poultry geists, yeah. <laughs> I do now have a six foot tall scouser living in the kitchen. Which nobody wants to do. Nobody wants. So, uh, well, that, uh, that very nearly brings us to the end of this, uh, this overview of my career in a nutshell. Quite a large nut, I think you'll agree. But uh, before I go, I've left one invention till last. And, uh, well, it's a rather sensitive topic. So uh, I wanted to give you something to talk about and debate uh, as you leave. Suicide. The first time you kill yourself is always the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you plan to blow your brains out, but you don't want to get blood all over your Laura Ashley floral wallpaper. Uh, because, let's face it, per roll that ain't cheap. So I've come up with an invention. Uh, that should hopefully reduce on the, uh, on the mess of post-suicide batter splatter. It's, uh, well, it's essentially a bin bag. It's, uh, I call it the bin bag hat. <laughs> See, the, uh, the user places the bin bag on their head, and then, uh, well, they shoot themselves, and the bag is designed to catch any post-suicide matter splatter, uh, so that wall-wise, there'll be minimal cleanup. Um, and as an added bonus, uh, whoever finds the body can simply uh, fold you up, pop you in, pop you on the curb. So, uh, minimal fuss, minimal fuss. <laughs> Now, I am going to do a, a, a product demonstration of this one. But, I have been asked by the management uh, to do it backstage, just in case there's any wayward spray. Uh, so, uh, so, I'm going to do that, but before I do, just in case everything goes right, slash wrong, I'm covering all eventualities here, um, I've written a, uh, well, I've written a note. Um, and, uh, like, I'd, I'd quite like someone to come up and, um, if I, if I don't return after shooting myself, I'd, I'd like you to read it. So, um, if you would, uh, just mind I'm coming up, uh, anyone come up? Uh, yes, just come up. It's very sensitive, so I just, um, so just take a seat on the seat, so. um, You go there, so. See, what's going to happen, I, I'm going to go off, I'm going to shoot myself. And once you hear the bang, uh, if you would all mind uh, just counting to five, uh, do it aloud if you wish. And, uh, and then after that, could you read the note, please? So, um, can, we, uh, can we get some Jurassic music for the, uh, the grand finale, please? Right, I'm going uh, to go off and I'm going uh, to try this whole uh, tune of myself vlog, as you kids call it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not in the gun. I don't know if you can hear me, I'm loading the gun, so uh, that's, that's what's going to happen here. Right? I'm now putting the bullet in the... No, I'll, I'll drop the bullet, I'll drop the bullet. I don't, I don't, I don't know where the bullet's gone. I've found, the, I've found... I have found the bullet. I've, I've lost the bag, I've lost the bag. I've, I've found the bullet, I've lost the bag, I've got the bag, I've got the bullet. We're all set to go. I am now going to attempt to shoot. No, I've lost the bag again. This is, this is, it's all happening too fast. I mean, it's a very, you know, it's a sensitive topic. I don't want to over dramatize this. I'm just going to shoot myself. Don't panic. I'm now loading the gun. Right, right the, gun is lo the gun is loaded. I'm putting it in my mouth. I don't know if you heard that. The, the gun was in my mouth. So uh, I've had to kind of tell you that the gun was in my mouth. But what I was actually saying was that the gun was in my mouth. So you miss nothing. You miss nothing. I know. I, I've, I've, I've lost the hat. The gun, is, the gun is near my mouth. It's in the general region of the mouth. And uh, I'm going to put the gun in my mouth. 
and, uh, and then I'm going to shoot myself. I am now ready to shoot myself. Thank <laughs> you. 